Welcome to TopCast and episode three, or part three rather, of chapter one, The Theory of Everything from The Fabric of Reality by David Deutsch. Before I begin, a little note on my setup. Some people have been saying that it's a bit distracting when I'm actually reading from one of the books that I read from because I'm not staring straight into the screen. I'm going to try and remedy this. If anyone has any ideas for me about precisely how to go about doing that so it's not so distracting, I'd be happy to hear them. But one of the reasons it hasn't been a priority is because the overwhelming majority of people actually only listen. They don't actually watch. Uh, I think the downloads from the podcast version, the audio-only version, are like 10 times greater than the views that I get on YouTube. Um, And so (laughs) it would be so much more simple, uh, efficient if I didn't bother putting together the video because the video actually takes a lot longer to edit and all that sort of stuff. Audio is much easier to deal with. Nonetheless, I like doing the video, so I'm going to persevere with that. But if you have any ideas about how I can read by doing this, which is me like looking at the screen right now, while simultaneously looking straight at the camera, I would appreciate it. I use an iPhone, one of the the more recent iPhones, well, iPhone 11, in order to actually record the video and the audio goes into that. Uh, Don't need to go into the technical details. But anyway, if you have an idea for how I can fix the way in which I look at the camera whilst simultaneously reading, then that would be great. I know a thing called an auto cue exists, but um, presumably that's quite a professional piece of gear. Anyway, no more preamble. Let me get into the reading for today. And we're getting very close to the end of the chapter. And it's a very fun part of the end of the chapter because we start to encounter some real seeds. And I'm going to mention that word a few times today. Real seeds of... The Science of Canon Kant, which is sitting there behind me by Chiara Marletto. The beginnings of constructor theory. They're right here in the fabric of reality. And so I'm going to concentrate a little on that today. Not only in the fabric of reality, in the first few pages of the fabric of reality. So let's go. And I'm at the point where David says on page 23, quote, in the reductionist worldview, The laws governing subatomic particle interactions are of paramount importance, as they are the base of the hierarchy of all knowledge. But in the real structure of scientific knowledge, and in the structure of our knowledge of reality, such laws have a much more humble role. What is that role? It seems to me that none of the candidates for a theory of everything that has yet been contemplated contains much that is new by way of explanation. Perhaps the most innovative approach from the explanatory point of view is superstring theory, in which extended objects, strings, rather than point-like particles, are the elementary building blocks of matter. But no existing approach offers an entirely new mode of explanation, new in the sense of Einstein's explanation of gravitational forces in terms of curved space and time. Pausing there, just my reflection on this. So David has said right there that nothing about the other conceptions of the way in which we might improve physics off into the infinite future, string theory is one such, is a new mode of explanation. This term, mode of explanation, is right there at the beginning of the fabric of reality. And that's remarkable because here... In 1997, we have the motivation for constructor theory. We have the phrase mode of explanation. We can see those seeds, as I've talked about in previous episodes for the fabric of reality, for what is happening right now over the last few years and right now in 2021. It's almost like a prediction of the content of future knowledge, isn't it? Not quite. That's a joke, of course. But it's clear David is appealing for a new way forward in physics. It seems like no one else really took up the mantle between 1997 through to today. So he did and Chiara, and others. And it's another good reason for me to be doing this book right now alongside Chiara's book. Here we are getting the appeal for that new fundamental theory. And there, in Chiara's book, we are getting the description and explanation of what has been accomplished so far with this exact new theory, constructor theory. So it's a wonderful symmetry between the two books. Back to this book, The Fabric of Reality. And David writes... 
quote, In fact, the theory of everything is expected to inherit virtually its entire explanatory structure, its physical concepts, its language, its mathematical formalism, and the form of its explanations from the existing theories of electromagnetism, nuclear forces, and gravity. Therefore, we may look to this underlying structure, which we already know from existing theories, for the contribution of fundamental physics to our overall understanding. There are two theories in physics which are considerably deeper than all others. The first is the general theory of relativity, which, as I have said, is our best theory of space, time, and gravity. The second, quantum theory, is even deeper. Between them, these two theories, and not any existing or currently envisaged theory of subatomic particles, provide the detailed explanatory and formal framework within which all other theories in modern physics are expressed, and they contain overarching physical principles to which all other theories conform. A unification of general relativity and quantum theory to give a quantum theory of gravity has been a major quest of theoretical physicists for several decades and would have to form part of any theory of everything in either the narrow or the broad sense of the term. As we shall see in the next chapter, quantum theory, like relativity, provides a revolutionary new mode of explanation of physical reality. The reason why quantum theory is the deeper of the two lies more outside physics than within it for its ramifications are very wide, extending far beyond physics and even beyond science itself as it is normally conceived. Okay, pausing there, just my reflection on this. So, yes, quantum theory is the deeper of the two. We've got general relativity and we've got quantum theory, both of which purport to be explanations of the universe as a whole in a certain sense. The reason why quantum theory is the deeper of the two is because it affects other areas of our knowledge more so than what general relativity seems to. In another video that I did called The Nexus, which was some personal musings on the nature of personhood, I tried to describe what the implications are of our most modern understanding of quantum theory upon this question of what it means to be a person. Because we exist in a multiverse, and the multiverse consists of these interesting entities called fungible things, okay, so fungibility is this idea of where a particle or even a larger object, an ensemble of particles, which includes something like a human body, is extended across the multiverse. And so in order to understand the nature of personhood more fully, you need to grapple with quantum theory. So I think quantum theory absolutely has deep implications for the nature of personhood. It also, of course, has ramifications for the field of computation. And this is what David Deutsch actually proved in his famous 1986 paper. One of the things he's most famous for beyond writing books is this particular proof that he did, this proof of the possibility, the physical possibility of quantum computation, which means that now computation is truly a part of physics. So quantum theory's got ramifications there, and therefore it's also got ramifications for mathematics because it provides a limit constraints on what can be proved given those quantum mechanical laws. So because quantum mechanical laws are universal, they apply to everything in the universe, including the brains of mathematicians, it limits what those brains of those mathematicians can do or what computers can do that are made out of matter. And so quantum theory has this reach into mathematics, even into pure mathematics, because it is the very thing which tells you what laws, computers, things that prove stuff, which includes human brains, can do, what they are able to do. And then it also reaches, therefore, into epistemology, uh, beyond mathematics, because it provides constraints on our ability to perfectly know anything at all. We are necessarily fallible because we're error-prone human beings due to just making mistakes. But those mistakes are also embedded there in the laws of physics. 
And, it, and related to this, quantum theory mandates that not everything can be known simultaneously, that matter behaves in ways governed by quantum mechanical laws such that we have to rule out epistemic certainty, or in simple language, no, you cannot be sure of anything. You can have good explanations, but they must remain fallible. Even the contents of your own memory must remain fallible, given quantum theory, among other things. And so that that has ramifications for psychology, and so it goes. So these are just some of the senses in which quantum theory has implications for all those other areas that we typically partition off from the rest of science. Okay, back to the book, and David writes, quantum theory is one of what I shall call the four main strands of which our current understanding of the fabric of reality is composed. Before I say what the other three strands are, I must mention another way in which reductionism misrepresents the structure of scientific knowledge. Not only does it assume that explanation always consists of analysing a system into smaller, simpler systems, it also assumes that all explanation is of later events in terms of earlier events. In other words, that the only way of explaining something is to state its causes. And this implies that the earlier the events in terms of which we explain something, the better the explanation. So that ultimately, the best explanations of all are in terms of the initial state of the universe. Just pausing there. There we're getting constructive theory again. This idea that the best explanations are in terms of something that happened earlier that caused something to happen later is, of course, all this dynamical laws and initial conditions vision of physics. This uh, kind of narrow way of viewing the way in which the universe evolves over time and the way in which change happens at all in the universe. Back to the book, David writes, A theory of everything which excludes a specification of the initial state of the universe is not a complete description of physical reality because it provides only laws of motion. And laws of motion by themselves make only conditional predictions. That is, they never state categorically what happens, but only what will happen at one time, given what was happening at another time. Only if a complete specification of the initial state is provided can a complete description of physical reality in principle be deduced. Pausing there, um, yeah, my reflection again. So I have heard theoretical physicists, specifically particle physicists, say that the deeper theory of everything would be one that would provide the initial conditions in some way as a matter of necessity, like mathematical necessity. Now, I suppose that's one way to go. Of course, all you then get out of that so-called theory of everything is, again, this reductionist idea that gives you, that would give you the initial conditions and then the dynamical laws, presumably. And you would have this deeper theory, this deeper mathematical theory that says, well, these initial conditions can only be in such and such a way. But whatever that theory is that gives you these initial conditions of the universe, you might ask of that theory why it has the form that it does. I suppose you get into some kind of infinite regress then. I don't know exactly how they resolve this. Anyways, whatever the case, David in that passage there and in the next few passages is really emphasizing this idea that this initial conditions, dynamical laws kind of thing, the, the laws of motion and initial conditions problem, doesn't seem to be able to provide a true theory of everything. So he's really providing clues there for someone else had they wanted to create constructor theory. It reminds me a little bit of another book that I've read recently called From Zero to One, which is by the entrepreneur Peter Thiel. If you don't know who he is, he's Elon Musk's sort of offsider. He's another billionaire. He was Elon Musk's offsider. He worked on PayPal and so on. Smart guy, businessman. Anyway, his book, From Zero to One, is about how to create a business or a startup. Young people come up to him and want to know how to become rich themselves by creating a new business. They seem to be after the recipe, the algorithm. Of course, his advice is he can't possibly tell you that because they're is no such algorithm. There is no recipe. If it were that simple, then everyone would just follow the recipe and become rich. But that's the very point about creativity. Similarly, physicists want to make fundamental breakthroughs. They need creativity. Here in the fabric of reality, we've got the same thing. There are clues here for the taking for anyone who might have wanted to conceive of a new mode of explanation. 
But the thing is, with any of this stuff, it has to be a very personal thing. It has to be part of your personal problem situation, as Popper might put it. Unless you are truly, really invested in the problem, then you won't spend much time thinking about it. David did, of course, so much that he wrote a book on it, and then he went on to begin to solve the problems that he is laying out here in constructor theory. The point is, anyone can do it. They just have to choose to do it and become interested in it. But most won't. Most won't actually be that genuinely interested. Even people with physics degrees. I have a physics degree. It doesn't mean anything in terms of trying to create fundamental theories because that's not part of my problem situation. I'm genuinely not deeply interested enough. I'm more interested in, for example, in my particular problem situation, trying to explain ideas that have already been discovered in new ways so that people out there who have a casual interest can to some extent level up and learn more about this and perhaps then develop a really deep interest in it. I think that's what sort of my function is in this. I don't have any illusions that I'm going to make deep breakthroughs here, but maybe someone listening will be enticed to go off and read the details, read the technical details, and then they perhaps will make some of the more fundamental breakthroughs. It all depends on what you find fun doing. I have fun just talking about this and solving the problem of trying to explain it with ever more clarity in more and more simple terms to the extent that I can. But what I notice sometimes is that, well, I'll, I'll just say it, sometimes people seem to kid themselves. I see this in physics to some extent. People who say they either want to be physicists, want to make breakthroughs, they're already in physics, but you dig a little and it's quickly apparent that this is not how their life is quite set up. They're actually invested rather more in other things. They have other interests as well. They have other problems, and that's perfectly fine. But there might be something that psychologists call, to the extent that it exists, cognitive dissonance. Not really being aware that your explicit words about what you're trying to achieve don't quite match up to what you're doing day-to-day -day in reality behind the scenes. To put this another way, Einstein, it might have been thought while he was working at a patent office, was just working on relativity as a kind of hobby. But that would be to misunderstand what was going on. So many of his waking moments were devoted solely to figuring out these problems. He was obsessed by the fun of finding this stuff out. And later on, being a physicist wasn't a job that he clocked into and worked up until morning tea and then clocked off again and then went back to work at his desk for another few hours while checking emails and so on. No, he was utterly obsessed with figuring out specific problems. And he made progress because he was passionate and he found joy in solving these particular problems. And there's a difference there between that kind of approach towards problem solving in a specific area and those who might say that that's what they want to do, but instead are splitting their attention and their fun between many other things. And of course, that's totally fine. This is not a judgment. It is the difference between being able to, because you have a finite amount of attention and a finite amount of creativity given a certain amount of finite time in order to solve particular problems. And if you are utterly obsessed with certain problems, then you're probably going to make, you're possibly going to make more progress there than someone who is not quite so obsessed. That's my diversion on the psychology of making progress in, in physics and in elsewhere. I don't do it often, and I'm not about to be doing it often here either. So let's go back to the book. And David writes, Current cosmological theories do not provide a complete specification of the initial state, even in principle. But they do say that the universe was initially very small, very hot, and very uniform in structure. We also know it cannot have been perfectly uniform, because that would be incompatible according to the theory with the distribution of galaxies we observe across the sky today. The initial variations in density, lumpiness, 
would have been greatly enhanced by gravitational clumping. That is, relatively dense regions would have attracted more matter and become denser, so they need only have been very slight initially. Pausing there, yes, my reflection on this. Uh, this, this lumpiness was a mystery for some time. It was a, it was a mystery until the COBE, the, 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 the satellite, satellite telescope called the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer, which took the first images uh, somewhere between 1989 and 1993 of the cosmic microwave background, the heat left over after the Big Bang. Now, prior to COBE, the thing was that wherever we pointed our telescopes, effectively temperature probes at the sky, we found exactly the same temperature everywhere, 2.3 um, above absolute zero, 2.3 Kelvin, or 2.3 degrees Celsius above absolute zero, the minimum possible temperature. So the universe is bathed in this heat, but it's extremely uniform. And that is, that's kind of a problem. It's a problem because the universe itself, when you look in the visual band or in any other band aside from the microwave band, if you're looking, if you're looking at things other than um, at that temperature, you find lumpiness, as David says here. And this is, in fact, what the astronomers and the astrophysicists talk about and the cosmologists talk about. They talk about the lumpiness of the universe. Of the universe. There are regions where there are galaxies. That's a lump. And the regions between galaxies, which have nothing at all. But why is the distribution of matter the way that it is, given that the cosmic microwave background is not lumpy? Well... The Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer, this satellite that was put up there in the late 80s, early 90s, revealed that, in fact, the Cosmic Microwave Background is lumpy after all. It's not perfectly uniform. It has these regions of cooler and warmer. And the cooler areas are going to be the places where, in the early universe, the matter would have been attracted towards. That's where it would have collapsed. And in the warmer areas where the matter would have expanded out. So you get the voids in the area where you get the higher temperature. And in the cooler areas, that's where the galaxies form. And that's where the stars form. And that's where your, your glowing matter forms. And, and, and this is, this is uh, George Smoot was awarded the Nobel Prize for this. Uh, although his student is Charlie Lineweaver that I've talked about very, very often. It was his uh, research student, his PhD student at the time. I think it was his PhD student. It might have been his graduate student. Anyway, uh, Charlie Lineweaver, the great Charlie Lineweaver, he's also one of these physicists not on social media, which is a great shame. He's got this wonderful list of papers that, that stretch from biology and cancer through to cosmology and astrophysics and planetary science and all this sort of great stuff and he's a great speaker as well you can find him on uh, YouTube and I always talk him up because he was my lecturer and so he tells the story about how uh, he was actually the one that processed the data and he was looking for that data from the cosmic microwave background explorer and it was something it's like 2 a.m uh, uh, one early one morning that he finally figured out we do have the so-called anisotropies which is a fancy name for this lumpiness this variation in the cosmic microwave background and he was so excited he had to get on his push bike and and ride to george smoot's house and 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 slip the um the the the, the research he's slipped the, the discovery of the, the anisotropies underneath George Smoot's door, uh, I think with the words, uh, we found it, uh, written on the top of it. And so uh, that was the moment. That was the moment of the discovery of the cosmic microwave background anisotropies. Now, why is this so? Who cares about this? Well, the reason that you get these anisotropies, that these variations in the temperature, goes back to quantum theory. Um, it, it, Stephen Hawking actually described it as like looking at the face of God, looking at this image is like looking at the face of God. It's a bit of an exaggeration, of course. But basically, the lumpiness is there in the earliest universe. The, the, the earliest image we have of the universe, that lumpiness seems to be explained by quantum mechanical laws, the quantum fluctuations acting on a universe which was small enough, you know, the size of an atom or whatever, such that the effects back then had lumpiness in them. But quantum mechanical laws lead to this lumpiness. And so then when the universe expanded, so too did the lumpiness. And so you get this lumpiness today on the very largest scales because that is an image of 
what it was like at the beginning of time, <laughs> because the beginning of time was quite, was governed by quantum mechanical laws, which necessarily led to this sort of thing. If we didn't have quantum mechanical laws, presumably the universe would have been perfectly uniform and it would have expanded out such that you wouldn't get lumpiness, which means you might not have gotten stars in the way that we have stars now. And so you, certainly you wouldn't have had the distribution of galaxies in the way that they are now. So I find that absolutely astounding. It's astounding to think that the effects of quantum theory at the very smaller scales, namely on the universe when it was much smaller than an atom, can be seen today, revealed today, in the universe as a whole. The, the, the structure of the universe as a whole, the very largest scales, have been determined by what was going on at the beginning of the universe. Which shouldn't be so surprising. I mean, this is what goes on with initial conditions and dynamical laws after all. Anyway, if you want to learn more about that, you can look up the, the, the history of the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer. After that, by the way, there was this thing called WMAP, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. And so they, they improved the image of, the, of COBE, of the Cosmic Microwave Background. And today, um, the most recent one is the Planck the Planck satellite has, has again given us uh, images of this to even greater resolution. So um, very interesting area of science. Um, one of these pieces of evidence explained by the theory of the Big Bang. Okay, after that extended self-indulgent diversion, let's go back to the book. And David writes, But slight though they were, this variations in density is what he's talking about, but slight though they were, they are of the greatest significance in any reductionist description of reality because almost everything that we see happening around us from the distribution of stars and galaxies in the sky to the appearance of bronze statues on planet Earth is, from the point of view of fundamental physics, a consequence of those variations. If our reductionist description is to cover anything more than the grossest features of the observed universe, we need a theory specifying those all-important initial deviations from uniformity. Let me try to restate this requirement without the reductionist bias. The laws of motion for any physical system make only conditional predictions and are therefore compatible with many possible histories of that system. This issue is independent of the limitations on predictability that are imposed by quantum theory, which I shall discuss in the next chapter. For instance, the laws of motion governing a cannonball fired from a gun are compatible with many possible trajectories, one for each possible direction and elevation in which the gun could have been pointing when it was fired. And this is the figure from the fabric of reality. Mathematically, the laws of motion can be expressed as a set of equations called the equations of motion. These have many different solutions, one describing each possible trajectory. To specify which solution describes the actual trajectory, we must provide supplementary data, some data about what actually happens. One way of doing that is to specify the initial state, in this case, the direction in which the gun was pointing. But there are other ways too. For example, we could just as well specify the final state, the position and direction of motion of the cannonball at the moment it lands. Or we could specify the position of the highest point of the trajectory. It does not matter what supplementary data we give, so long as they pick out one particular solution of the equations of motion. Okay, pausing there. Now, for more on this, you can see chapter two of... The Science of Canon Kant by Chiara Marletto. Uh, there's a deep symmetry, as I've already said, between these two books. And to understand a little bit more about this, uh, the topic is projectile motion. And if you have the trajectory of a projectile, then there are unique coordinates X and Y. Well, not unique coordinates. There are specific coordinates X and Y which pick out a unique trajectory for any given projectile, as you can see there with the picture that David has provided. Uh, there's going to be, if you pick out in the plane that's there, in fact, you'll have X, Y, and Z coordinates in that particular three-dimensional version of it. Uh, if you pick out particular X, Y, Z coordinates, there will be only one of those possible trajectories that will fit that X, Y, Z coordinate. That X, Y, Z coordinate is the initial condition, so to speak, the supplementary data. We sometimes call it initial conditions if it's at the beginning, the final conditions, which is at the end, uh, or any other condition in between. So supplementary data is what you need. You need, a, you need a point along the trajectory to pick out that particular trajectory. 
as unique and different to all the other ones that could have possibly happened. But why that particular one? Well, that's the open question, especially when applied to the whole universe. And that's what David's about to get to. So let's go back to the book where he writes, the combination of any such supplementary data with the laws of motion amounts to a theory that describes everything that happens to the cannonball between firing and impact. Similarly, the laws of motion for physical reality as a whole would have many solutions, each corresponding to a distinct history. To complete the description, we should have to specify which history is the one that has actually occurred by giving enough supplementary data to yield one of the many solutions of the equations of motion. In simple cosmological models at least, one way of giving such data is to specify the initial state of the universe. But alternatively, we could specify the final state, or the state at any other time, or we could give some information about the initial state, some about the final state, and some about the states in between. In general, the combination of enough supplementary data of any sort with the laws of motion would amount to a complete description, in principle, of physical reality. Pausing there, yes, that's precisely right. But as we've been keen to highlight, such a description would be at best a predictive kind of description. It would never actually explain much at all about what happened, like, for example, evolution, knowledge creation, and therefore increasingly from this moment onwards, what actually occurs in the universe. Because from this moment onwards, knowledge creation will become the dominant unfolding feature of the universe into the distant future, so long as we don't go extinct, and perhaps there are other people out there. Whatever the case, we are going to begin constructing around us, transforming physical reality around us, and that is to do with the knowledge we have, trying to understand why certain things are going to happen. For example, the construction of cities is not going to be explained by the simple laws of physics and supplementary data. What we need, of course, is an explanation in terms of people's choices and their wanting to create certain things and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, we've made that point throughout the beginning of infinity. But here it is uh, in the fabric of reality. Back to the book, and David writes, For the cannonball, once we have specified, say, the final state, it is straightforward to calculate the initial state and vice versa, so there is no practical difference between different methods of specifying the supplementary data. But for the universe, most such calculations are intractable. Pausing there. Ah, yes. This is to put things mildly, of course. (laughs) <laughs> it's intractable to try to figure out the trajectories of all the particles in the entire universe. Yes. Given that for a single particle, just pick any single particle, like an electron, there's no sense in which the observables you need in order to make a precise prediction can be known simultaneously anyway. Um, Sam Kuypers, who is a physicist who collaborates with David Deutsch, has written uh, and collaborated with uh, David Deutsch on a number of papers. He's written some on his own, exploring variations, subtle variations to quantum theory about a related point. But I won't go into the details uh, about that, but you can see here for Sam's excellent papers. They're highly technical, and I guess to be true, to be honest, they're not precisely related to what I'm about to mention here, but I just want to observe that on this point about a deterministic universe, and I've said this before, it's true in a very basic sense, okay, namely stuff is indeed determined in the universe. We live in a deterministic universe. Things happen according to the laws of physics, and it wouldn't matter if the laws of physics mandated that any old random stuff happened, that would still be determined by laws of physics. We are governed by laws of physics. As it happens, we're governed by quantum mechanical laws of physics and laws of general relativity as well. Things happen according to the laws of physics. But this is utterly different, utterly different to things being predictable. We live in a deterministic universe, but not in a predictable universe, I would argue. And there is predictable in practice and there's predictable in principle. And I want to suggest that neither in principle, neither in practice nor in principle can we make predictions about the universe as a whole. Let me give the we can't predict things in practice for the whole universe. This is the easy one. In order to be able to predict in practice how the universe is going to evolve over time with certainty of some kind, that would mean to know 
the conditions of the universe right now or the initial conditions of the universe, which is basically the same thing. One's not necessarily going to be easier than another. Presumably right now, finding the conditions right now of every single particle would be easier than finding the conditions of every single particle in the deep dark past because we only have access to measurements right now. So can we get this perfect knowledge that we need of every single particle in order to plug in this supplementary data into our equations of motion for all the particles in the universe? It would seem to be clearly not. One would wonder by what mechanism you're going to make these measurements of every single particle in the universe. What instruments would you need to do this? Uh, what, what are they made out of? And are these instruments themselves that do the measurements of the particles themselves made of particles for which you need to know their conditions at any given time? We have a recursive problem, don't we? We'll need instruments measuring instrument. We'll need, we'll need instruments measuring particles, the positions and momenta, presumably, of particles. But those instruments themselves are made of particles, so we need to find the momentum and the position of those particles as well in the instruments. But to do that, we need more instruments. So we've got this weird infinite regress of trying to measure everything, including the, the measuring devices themselves. So I don't think that in practice it's possible. And in principle, we've got a problem as well. People often say things like, well, the Oracle or the supercomputer, to, to, to take it away from the supernatural, the supposed quantum supercomputer of the future might be able to somehow or other have the conditions of all particles in the universe plugged into it and thereby make a perfect prediction of how the universe is going to unfold off into the infinite future. But I don't think that it can. And, and, and one reason why I don't think that it can is because the conditions right now, the, 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 whatever the conditions are at time t, call it now, in, in, in this room where I am, are going to be different to the conditions for particles on the other side of the galaxy, let alone the other side of the universe. There is no now, here, now, that is the same for here as compared to the other side of the galaxy. Relativity tells us that whatever you think is going on here right now might be well and good, but your knowledge of what is going on over there is limited by the finite speed of light. You cannot know now what is happening there now because guess what? There is no simultaneous now, here, and now over there. That is known as the relativity of simultaneity. Now, I'm somewhat practiced in explaining this, so let me do it very, very briefly. This is the, this is the classic so-called thought experiment, and it goes like this. Let's say you're sitting in the middle of a train, and it's a special kind of train where you can pull a chain in the middle of the train, and it will turn on a light that is immediately above your head. And to your left and to your right, there is a door. And the door is opened at either end of the train by a light. So as soon as the light, when you switch it on, reaches the doors, the doors will open. So if you're right in the middle of the train and you pull the chain and the light switches on, then it will reach, if you're right in the middle of the train, it will reach the front and the rear doors simultaneously. It will reach both of those doors at the same time. So both of the doors will open according to you, at precisely the same time. Now, this is all dependent on the fact that the speed of light is constant. It doesn't matter whether the light is traveling to the left or to the right, forwards or backwards, to the rear door or to the front door. The speed of light is constant, always for all observers. That's a fact. That is one of the postulates of special relativity. But now, and here's the key brain bending thing if you've never heard it before. Let's say you're watching from the outside of the train. As someone inside the train performs this experiment, they're turning the light on. They're in the middle of the train. They observe the light travel to the front and rear of the train, striking the front and rear doors simultaneously, causing those doors to open up simultaneously. But you are now on the outside. Let's presume 
the train is now moving from the left to the right. The person inside the train, they don't care about this. After all, the light's still going to travel a certain distance to the front and a certain distance to the back, and that distance happens to be the same. The doors open simultaneously. Ah, but for the person outside, as they see the train moving from the left and moving to the right, what they notice is as the light is switched on, as the light is switched on, it will travel towards the rear of the train, which is coming towards the light now. So effectively, that light beam has a shorter distance to travel. It will strike that rear door first, whereas the light beam that is traveling towards the front door now has further to travel because that front door has moved away from where the light began and it has further to travel. So for the person outside, they see the rear door strike the beam of light, causing that rear door to open up not simultaneously with the front door, because at the front door, the light beam is still yet to reach there, because it's a finite speed of light. It can only travel so far in so much amount of time. And although it struck the rear door, opening that rear door, the front door is still closed. So the person on the outside of the train sees that the rear door is opened, and the front door has not yet opened. But the person inside the train says, no, I'm here inside the train. And I have seen that both of those doors have opened simultaneously. The person on the outside says, no, they haven't. I can see right now. I have make, made an observation. These two doors have, have not opened at the same time, have not opened simultaneously. Now, if you've never heard that before, it can screw with your mind a little bit, I would suggest. Okay, This is the relativity of simultaneity. And it's to do with the deep fact of the universe, which is the speed of light is constant. This is not something that we're used to in day-to-day -day life. People have struggled for a long time. They did struggle for a long time to accept that this is true. And physicists know that this is true. And you should accept that this is true because this is the explanation of how things work. So... People won't agree about now, about what is happening now. For the person inside of the train, they say that now the two doors open simultaneously. The person on the outside, they say, no, now the doors didn't open simultaneously. In fact, there is no now in which the doors open simultaneously. In other words, even for a simple situation like this, we can't agree on what the supplementary data might be. Okay, we can't agree, let alone what's going to happen here compared to the other side of the universe for every single particle. Now, there's a proviso here, I accept. Because there is something actually they can agree on. That something is called the space-time interval. They will agree on what that is. So there is actually something that's constant in the universe, so to speak, in relativity. But that's beyond the scope of what I'm talking about right now. Anyways, this all comes to bear on this idea that we can have something like perfect knowledge in principle of the initial conditions of the universe now or at any other time, making what I would suggest an in-principle prediction of the unfolding of the universe, despite the fact everything is determined, an in-principle prediction cannot be done. And because an in-principle prediction cannot be done, there's no point debating about what such and such uh, evolution of the universe would be if only we knew. We can't know. And this, it, among many other things, I think this is, well, there's many ways, but th this, is a, this is a reason why reductionists should accept the fact, they shouldn't be reductionists, but one reason why they can accept the fact that this provides scope for genuine creativity in the universe. Things to be able to come into being in the universe that weren't there before, that can't be adequately explained by an appeal to the laws of physics. Things like knowledge creation. Okay, so all of that was just a response to David's sentence there, where he says, but for the universe, most such calculations are intractable. Yes, intractable, to put it mildly. <laughs> Back to the book, and he writes, I have said that we infer the existence of lumpiness in the initial conditions from observations of lumpiness today, but that is exceptional. Most of our knowledge of supplementary data of what specifically happens is in the form of high-level theories about emergent phenomena and is therefore, by definition, not practically expressible in the form of statements about the initial state. For example, in most solutions of the equations of motion, the initial state of the universe does not have the right properties for life 
to evolve from it. Therefore, our knowledge that life has evolved is a significant piece of the supplementary data. We may never know what, specifically, this restriction implies about the detailed structure of the Big Bang, but we can draw conclusions from it directly. For example, the earliest accurate estimate of the age of the Earth was made on the basis of the biological theory of evolution, contradicting the best physics of the day. Only a reductionist prejudice could make us feel that this was somehow a less valid form of reasoning, or that, in general, it is more fundamental to theorise about the initial state than about emergent features of reality. Even in the domain of fundamental physics, the idea that theories of the initial state contain our deepest knowledge is a serious misconception. One reason is that it logically excludes the possibility of explaining the initial state itself, why the initial state was what it was. But in fact, we have explanations of many aspects of the initial state, and more generally, no theory of time can possibly explain it in terms of anything earlier. Yet we do have deep explanations from general relativity, and even more from quantum theory, of the nature of time. And pausing there, again, see some more discussion of this in the science of Canon Kant. If you can't wait for my discussion of the fabric of reality, chapter 11, which is not going to come for presumably months. Um, or of course, hopefully, buy the book, buy the fabric of reality and get there much sooner. Back to the book, David writes. Thus, the character of many of our descriptions, predictions and explanations of reality bear no resemblance to the initial state plus laws of motion picture that reductionism leads to. There is no reason to regard high-level theories as in any way second-class citizens. Our theories of subatomic physics and even of quantum theory or relativity are in no way privileged relative to theories about emergent properties. None of these areas of knowledge can possibly subsume all the others. Each of them has logical implications for the others, but not all the implications can be stated, for they are emergent properties of the other theories' domains. In fact, the very terms high-level and low-level are misnomers. The laws of biology, say, are high-level, emergent consequences of the laws of physics. But logically, some of the laws of physics are then emergent consequences of the laws of biology. It could even be that, between them, the laws governing biological and other emergent phenomena would entirely determine the laws of fundamental physics. Uh, this, this, uh, pausing there, this idea that the laws of physics might emerge from some fundamental laws of biology um, reminds me of that scene in The Big Bang Theory with um, Sheldon, who's the character who's the theoretical physicist, and he's debating with who would eventually be his girlfriend, Amy, who's a neuroscientist, I think. And they're arguing about what's more fundamental or what's logically prior, the laws of physics or the new laws of neurobiology. Uh, Sheldon, of course, says physics is, but Amy has this argument that given that all of what we know about physics comes from human brains anyway, an understanding of how they work must be a priori in a way prior to physics. If you really want to understand where physics is coming from, you've got to study the human brain. Therefore, neuroscience is deeper <laughs> than what physics is. Of course, that's a silly debate and it, it, it misses the point about um, actually what thinking is and the fact that uh, the physics is outside of brains and all that sort of stuff. But uh, <laughs> it made me think of that. And, and that idea that um, David just says there, that's quite a striking claim that the laws of biology and other emergent phenomena might completely determine the laws of fundamental physics would certainly upset the Sheldon Coopers of the world or anyone who wants to argue that the physical laws and initial conditions picture rules out the reality, the reality of emergent phenomena. <clears throat> Free will, of course. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Back to the book, David writes. But in any case, when two theories are logically related, logic does not dictate which of them we ought to regard as determining, wholly or partly, the other. That depends on the explanatory relationships between the two theories. The truly privileged theories are not the ones referring to any particular scale of size or complexity, nor the ones situated at any particular level of the predictive hierarchy, but the ones that contain the deepest explanations. The fabric of reality does not only consist of reductionist ingredients like space, time, and subatomic particles, but also of life, thought, computation, and the other things to which those explanations refer. What makes a theory more fundamental and less derivative is not its closeness to the supposed predictive base of physics, 
but its closeness to our deepest explanatory theories. Quantum theory is, as I have said, one such theory, but the other three main strands of explanation through which we seek to understand the fabric of reality are all high level from the point of view of quantum physics. They are the theory of evolution, primarily the evolution of living organisms, epistemology, the theory of knowledge, and the theory of computation, about computers and what they can and cannot in principle compute. Pausing there my reflection. So these are the four strands. Quantum theory, theory of evolution, epistemology, theory of computation. Now, as I said previously, our previous episode, uh, this idea of theory of everything, well, already there's unification happening here, and to some extent we must concede the theory of computation, really, has been subsumed into physics anyway. It's a, it's a theory of physics, so it's, it's part of quantum physics. I mean, the theory of quantum computation really is the theory of computation as viewed through the lens of quantum theory. And it places, you know, strict constraints on what computers can and can't do, namely what those quantum laws of physics say that they can. And given that brains, the things that create knowledge about the universe are a kind of computer, then the theory of knowledge really is very much a part of this theory of computation, which is a part of quantum physics as well. So there are these deep, deep links and I said in the Nexus video as well, well, given that we are evolved biological organisms, we've kind of, we human beings, we are the, we are the thing, the entity in the universe that unifies all of these things in a very real physical way, okay? We've evolved to create knowledge, which is itself a kind of computation that is done by a computer obeying quantum laws of physics, okay? So, <laughs> again, my Nexus video for more about that. Okay, let's go back to the book. And David writes, As I shall show, such deep and diverse connections have been discovered between the basic principles of these four apparently independent subjects that it has become impossible to reach our best understanding of any one of them without also understanding the other three. The four of them taken together form a coherent explanatory structure that is so far-reaching and has come to encompass so much of our understanding of the world that, in my view, it may already properly be called the first real theory of everything. Thus, we have arrived at a significant moment in the history of ideas, the moment when our scope of understanding begins to be fully universal. Up to now, all our understanding has been about some aspect of reality untypical of the whole. In the future, it will be about a unified conception of reality, all explanations will be understood against the backdrop of universality, and every new idea will automatically tend to illuminate not just a particular subject, but to varying degrees, all subjects. The dividend of understanding that we will eventually reap from, from this last great unification may far surpass that yielded by any previous one, for we shall see that it is not only physics that is being unified and explained here, and not only science, but also potentially the far reaches of philosophy, logic and mathematics, ethics, politics and aesthetics, perhaps everything that we currently understand and probably much that we do not yet understand. Pausing there, my reflection. If I was to reflect on why I would bother <laughs> spending so much of my time explaining these ideas, why I would devote uh, a rather large fraction of my life to doing this, to trying to do public outreach, to trying to spread these ideas, to try and uh, uh, have people appreciate the significance of this so that they too could perhaps contribute uh, to uh, solving this particular problem, then it's all encapsulated there. I mean, how much more grand a vision of reality do you want? There have been unifications in the past. Electricity and magnetism into a unified theory of electromagnetism by Faraday and Gauss and others. The unification of um, a standard model of particle physics. Uh, the, 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 the unification of space and time by Einstein. You know, the, the, these unifications that have happened in physics. But here David is talking about how we can have the unification of disparate theories in different subjects coming together to give us a far deeper, richer explanation of reality as a whole. 
that will touch everything, everything, everything that we know. Philosophy, logic, mathematics, ethics, politics, aesthetics. Okay, he mentions aesthetics, of course, in the beginning of Infinity as well. It sharpens that up too. So it's not like this is just throwaway kind of um, 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 hopes that he's, that he's dreaming up here. There's actually been progress made on lots of these points between the time of writing through the beginning of Infinity and through to the science of Canon Kant. Uh, his only work, as I've said before, um, quantum computation, that entire field, was a unification of computation and um, uh, quantum theory. So it's happened. What more do you want out of life, you know, in terms of understanding and being able to solve problems than being able to uh, unify all of that stuff? So uh, I can't think of a, a better kind of science to really dive into than this one. All other sciences are ultimately going to be aspects of this grand theory of everything. And of course, the interesting thing about this particular theory of everything is it doesn't solve all problems. It just provides a framework in which we can come to understand solutions to those problems better. And of course, uh, better. And so as, as, as he's said elsewhere, it would, this would only be the first such theory of everything, giving us a vision there to see the next theory of everything, which would unify even more. Presumably, once we have this, this kind of theory of everything, uh, we would then, it would reveal new problems because for any solution, any theory will open up new problems that we could not possibly have imagined before in the worldview that we presently hold. And so that would enable new, better solutions to arise to the new, better problems that we discover. Let's go back to the last very last part of the book, and then I'll read a little bit of the glossary that's that it's at, at the end that is at the end of this book as well. David writes, quote, "What conclusion then would I address to my younger self, who rejected the proposition that the growth of knowledge was making the world ever less comprehensible? I would agree with him, though I now think that the important issue is not really whether what our particular species." understands can be understood by one of its members. It is whether the fabric of reality itself is truly unified and comprehensible. There is every reason to believe that it is. As a child, I merely knew this. Now I can explain it. End of the chapter. Okay, and there's terminology at the end. There's a, there's a little glossary at the end. And I won't always read this, but I just think that there's some stuff here that, that is worth um, going over. I'm not going to read all the words in the terminology section in the little glossary at the end of the chapter, but this is worth pointing out. At the end of the chapter, he's got a definition of the word explanation. And in brackets, he says, roughly, a statement about the nature of things and the reasons for things. So there you see, and as I asked David in my questions for David, one of my recent questions for David, and you can find these on YouTube uh, or on podcast. Uh, I might even put a link, hopefully I'll remember, I'll put a link below this video to this particular one, asking David about, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the motivation for uh, sharpening up this uh, understanding of what an explanation is in the beginning of infinity. And in fact, his TED talk, you know, he says that explanations are hard to vary while still accounting for the thing they purport to account for, the phenomena they purport to account for. Uh, but here we don't have that. And the reason um, that we don't have it here is because uh, he thought, and he says of himself, you know, erroneously, he thought that it was just an uncontroversial kind of a word, but it's not, of course. Uh, we now know that. And so he has sharpened it up very helpfully for the rest of us. And I think that this really pushes a Popperian epistemology ahead uh, in, a, in, a, in a very valuable way. In, uh, because explanations reach beyond science into every other field that we happen to be interested in. And it also sharpens up what science is about. Science isn't merely about testable theories or even testable explanations. It's about finding good explanations of things, good explanations of things as defined in the fabric of reality. Go, to there, go there for that. Now, the next word he defines is instrumentalism. And it's a word that comes up here in the beginning of infinity and elsewhere. And it's going to come up throughout the fabric of reality, especially as we talk about the physics sections. Instrumentalism means... The view that the purpose of a scientific theory is to predict the outcomes of experiments. Now, that definition is only, you know, the only point of that definition 
it seems to me. It only applies to physics, and even then, usually only to uh, particular kinds of physics, particle physics and quantum physics and stuff. You know, it, it's a bias from those areas. You ask a geophysicist <laughs> if the purpose of science is to predict the outcomes of experiments, and they're not going to be happy with that. <laughs> okay? A geophysicist actually wants to know what really is in the center of the Earth or in the ground beneath their feet. They want to know that that's where the minerals are. Okay? It's not merely predicting that the... Uh, resistivity found by a particular meter that you're using to look into the ground happens to be this or that. That's not what it's about. Certainly not what an astronomer wants to know either. Okay, astronomer wants to know if there really is a planet orbiting that star or if that star is a white dwarf as opposed to a red giant and so on. Much less biology, uh, medicine, uh, think of any science that you're interested in. Okay, Instrumentalism is this weird kind of philosophy that some philosophers are interested in. And they're only interested in it because there's this bad turn in theoretical physics, quantum physics, and so on. Okay. The next definition, yeah, positivism is the next word. Positivism, David says, an extreme form of instrumentalism, which holds that all statements other than those describing or predicting observations are meaningless. This view is itself meaningless according to its own criterion. Yes, precisely. Okay, so positivism just rules out understanding uh, the world at all, really. I mean, um, describing or predicting observations. I mean, all of philosophy. Um, uh, mathematics is not about observations. You know, pure mathematics is not about observations, but it's very useful. There's lots of things that aren't about observations. Um, and anyway, all statements. I mean... What about fiction? What about art? I mean, what are, what is a positivist supposed to... And this is where Wittgenstein... Uh, it's called the two versions of Wittgenstein. You know, we blame Wittgenstein for a lot of this, right? Ludwig Wittgenstein. In his uh, Tractatus, his first book, this impenetrable kind of... It's not nonsense, but, but basically... He was trying to say that the purpose of language is simply to describe stuff. Okay, and if you if you can't describe stuff, then well, it's pointless, useless metaphysical baggage, and you can you can do away with it. But you know, in his latter life, you know, the the second Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein version two, I th his book was Philosophical Investigations. He 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 rejects what he did in the Tractatus. He sort of says, "Well, I was wrong about all that," because he recognised that there's a whole lot of other reasons that language has for existing. Asking people questions, comforting people, um, writing fiction and so on, doing art. And there's all these other functions of language that aren't just about describing stuff or, or stating facts. There are other purposes for language. How this escaped him the first time around, I don't know. But he was focused very, very narrowly, very narrowly on science and problems within within science and, and, and trying to be a hard-nosed, macho kind of philosopher who just wanted to get rid of the the supernatural fair enough um, or discussions of of mystical stuff fair enough to some extent fair enough okay I, I can understand the motivation even if i don't um agree with it um but sometimes people go too far as i like to say baby in the bathwater and all that you know you, you you want to try and sharpen up things in philosophy but that doesn't mean you just do away with everything just because you've managed to um, dissect out certain amounts of nonsense. Okay, okay. next word um, David defines. I'm missing a few of them, but um, he also defines emergence. And he says, an emergent phenomena is one, such as life, thought, or computation, about which there are comprehensible facts or explanations that are not simply deducible from lower-level theories, but which may be explicable or predictable by higher-level theories referring directly to that phenomenon. Okay, so yeah, so emergence is a key part of understanding the world. You need to appreciate that. And, and common sense realism is about this, right? Man on the street type thinking is, of course, of course these things really exist, okay? And this is why people make fun of philosophers. You know, they... 
they knock on a table and they go, you know, is this real kind of thing? This is real. And they have long debates about whether or not the table is real. Man on the street looks at that and goes, yeah, that's ridiculous. Okay, it's like um, small brain, big brain, you know, a galaxy brain kind of thing. You know, small brain is, you know, like the table is real. And then supposedly the big brain philosopher comes along and says, well, actually, the table's not real because all that's there are fundamental particles. And the fundamental particles are only things that really, truly exist. The table doesn't exist. Woo. Of course, Galaxy Brain then looks at that and goes, well, that's ridiculous. Okay, all you're doing is um, kind of thinking in the abstract now. You're not really connecting with um, how objects actually do exist in reality. Cats exist. My cat happens to be sitting here today. Um, coffee mugs exist you know these emergent things exist people exist and in fact some of these things that are emergent things are also fundamental things okay and a fundamental thing is a thing which features in the explanations of lots of other things as well i like to say people are fundamental as fundamental as fundamental particles are and one day we might consider them in a sense more fundamental than fundamental particles because people might be able to exist in a universe without particles Okay, we might be able to be instantiated in something other than particles. I don't know how <laughs> right now. You know, some sort of gravitational pattern space-time or something. I don't know. But in order to have a person, you just need a way of processing information. Anyway, people, people are this confluence of, as I've already said and emphasized, the, the theory of evolution, the theory of computation, quantum theory, and epistemology. And so we're fundamental because we appear... Uh, in a sense, across all of those. It, well, we're not really there in quantum physics, but we're certainly there in epistemology. It doesn't, epistemology doesn't make sense in a world in which you don't have knowledge creators. Insofar as you've got evolution in the universe, then there is a possibility of people arising in such a universe. And if you've got po people in such a universe, then you've got these things that are uh, computers of a kind. In fact, you just need animals for that. Okay. I'm starting to rant. And so let me <laughs> stop here for today. Next time, we move on to chapter two, Shadows, which is, as I have said before, uh, probably the chapter that most affected me when I first read The Fabric of Reality back in 1997, because it was the, the chapter that cured me of my, up until then, complete disillusionment with quantum physics. I'd been doing quantum physics at university. I didn't understand what was going on. You know, I sort of, I could do the problems, but it was like, what am I doing? I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, this is all nonsense. And I was, uh, I, I was reassured by lecturers that, well, yeah, it's supposed to be nonsense. It's just a bit weird. Just shut up and calculate, so to speak. And I'd read lots of popular science books and none of them really helped. They all made it sound mystical until shadows, until I read The Fabric of Reality, Chapter 2. So that's next time. Look forward to that. It's going, I would presume, to be... I think I'll get through it fairly quickly. And the reason is because I've talked about the multiverse before. I've got a five or six-part series up there on YouTube all about the multiverse. And so I'm going to be referring to that quite a bit. So we'll be doing a a, a slimmed-down version of Chapter 2 of The Fabric of Reality, Shadows. But until then, bye-bye.